just sort of joystick them to get this alignment. You have to check it on the CM and then pass the KVAR. Once you have passed the one of the KVARs straight, then you actually see the range of motion. If you have reasonably good range of motion, you are practically uh, practically aligned that interarticular fragment well. How do you see lateral view? Yeah, so what we do is we keep a patient on the lateral position and we keep the hand on the posterior. So the C arm is from posterior to anterior and you just check when you are taking the lateral view, you hold the humerus like this and take it. So you always do this. You don't try to push this upwards. Then there is always, that's what we do for the supracondylar fracture as well. You can, you can, you can take a, uh, that is better of course, that is always better. If you rotate a C arm, it's always better. That's called shoot through x-rays. It's always better. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Doctor. Thank you, Chairman, sir. Have a safe journey back home. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sanjay Dhawan. He will be presenting on management of late supracondylar fractures in children. Uh, good morning to dear friends and seniors. I'm s sorry for my bad voice. Supracondylar fractures, they are the commonest fracture around the elbow in children. They are classified in type 1 is undisplaced. Type 2 is hinge fracture where you have a posterior cortex intact and type 3 is completely displaced. Now the management of these three is the con type 1 is treated conservatively, type 2 you can treat both conservatively and operatively and type 3 again you can treat conservatively but most of them are better treated with operative either open or close. <coughs> now supracondylar treatment <coughs> in type, uh, type 3 fracture you can treat them by fixing with K-wires. So there are different ways of fixing them. Out of these, the fixation from both the side, one medial and lateral wire, gives you a better stability. But you can fix, if you are scared of the ulnar nerve, you can fix it from lateral side, two wires. So the operative tick, the points which you need to remember, that image is to be moved from AP to lateral, always prefer this way, as if you try to rotate the elbow and see the lateral view, Many a time you, the reduction if you feel in the AP is good, but if you turn it, you lose the reduction. So it is always better to, read, to see the lateral view by turning the C arm. Now, you need to see few points. You take a Jones view, you all are aware of that, and in Jones view, you measure the Bowman's angle and see the medial and lateral pillar. Now, the Bowman's angle, if this is a, <coughs> there is a basic rule, if there is a change in f of 5 degree in Bowman's angle, that accounts for a final change of a clinical carrying angle of 2 degree. So any 5 degree change will result in 2 degree change of final carrying angle at the adult age. So this is, we have, we used to use a Bowman's angle, this is type, uh, this is A. Have a pointer? If you see this there, if you draw x, x, a line in the axis, this is line A, then epicondylar axis and then you draw and then you line, this is line C is drawn from the epicondylar epi lateral epiphysis. Now this angle is A which you used to you call a Bowman's angle initially. This was previously we used to Bowman's angle. Now we calculate Bowman's angle with this angle. Now this angle is measured from 64 to 81 degree, an average of 72 degree. So if this angle exceeds the 81 degree, now this angle if you see, this angle is more than 81, 81 degree, then you develop a, a, a coxa vera. So you have to keep this angle below 81 degree. To don't get, the, if you keep it below 81 degree, then you will not get the coxa vera finally. 
Now, you have to see the crescent sign. Crescent sign, if you have a lateral tilt, you have an overlap of epicondyle, lateral prefaces in the ulna. And if this, you find this sign is there, that means you have something bad with your reduction. You need to check your reduction and go back and re reduce it again. Then you have a lateral, in the lateral view again you see the fish tail sign. If you see this beak, if this beak is there, this again speaks of that there is a loss of reduction and you again go back and see your redu redo your reduction. So three things think you have to see, the Bowman's angle and lateral pillars, fish tail sign and the crescent sign. Now, in supracondylar fractures, we cannot accept this is not, not this is this reduction is not bad for supracondylar fracture. You have to have a absolutely correct because reduction. If you don't have, then you are leading to a problem in the future. Now, the late presenting supracondylar fracture. If you go by the literature, the literature you find if you have if the fracture is more than two days old, it is called late supracondylar fracture. Though it is a very common feature, most of the time you get supracondylar fractures which are two days old. The problems of these late presenting supracondylar fractures are that they are uniting fracture, so close reduction is difficult, and there is high incidence of stiffness, neurological and vascular complications, particularly after repeated manipulations, then chances of myositis ossificans and hazards of malunion and further need of a recorrective surgery. If you go by literature, Yen et al, he stated that if the fracture is greater than one week old, there is usually sufficient callus formation to make close reduction extremely difficult. In these cases, we advocate open reduction. Then again, Etting et al, the healing of metaphysis is faster in children, so presence of soft tissue callus by the end of first week renders the fracture irreducible. Rasul stated that open reduction and internal fixation should be preferred after swelling has subsided, but not later than five days after injury, since possibility of myositis ossificans increases after that. Kapoor et al. stated that attempting close reduction under general anesthesia is justified in cases presenting as late as a week before restoring open reduction. So the, gradually we developed a tendency that we can try some close reduction. So, the, But the usual consensus for these late presenting supracondylar fracture is to do open reduction in cases more than seven days. Now what I am, <coughs> so the treatment modalities for these open, uh, late presenting supracondylar fracture can be open reduction and pin fixation which is the currently best method and preferred method. Alternatively, you can leave them, there are advocates who say that you leave these fractures to unite, malunite and then correct after, uh, in a later date with osteotomy. Now problems of leaving this fracture to malunite is that you get develop a deformity, there is a stiffness and restriction of movement, long follow up with vigorous, vigorous physiotherapy and you have to wait for a fracture to remodel, increase deformity. <coughs> This de uh, deformity keeps on increasing as the time passes. Secondly, even if you correct these deformities, you see this the deformity is corrected, but you still have a hump, which, the, which is an ugly hump, which doesn't look good. So, so possible complications of a open, open reduction here can be infection, vascular injury, myositis, ossificans, excessive callus, residual stiffness, and decreased range of motion. So what I am going to give you is a technique which you maybe most of you must be using in your first cases also. But I just wanted to show you that this simple trick can be used in late presenting supracondylar fractures and you can get away with all these problems. So this is the technique. You are, this is late presenting supracondylar fracture. You can see the callus is there. And here you just manipulate it little bit gently in, a, in AP view, medial to lateral. Just break the callus slowly and then you start reducing it. So here it is already medially displaced. Now you see here, make a small nick if you require. Make a small nick and from here you put a, an artery and go, in, and go from the fracture and go it anteriorly to it. So now see here. And you have to manipulate the medial and lateral. You, may, you have already reused in the AP. 
manipulated it and then you are putting the artery inside and the push the fracture the distal fragment from the artery and it goes anteriorly the, you, if you see now and see the Z with this artery in Jones view also if you take now see you will have you see the Jones view in, again you can see AP and lateral both in both the views we have a good reduction Now again second case, this is again a late presenting supracondylar fracture, same trick applied, see, push the artery anteriorly, reduce it and with the artery in C2 you can put K wires, C AP view and this is finally you get lateral view and view. So in this case you need a we need to keep the patients from hospital stays for one to four days because they are late presenting supracondylar fracture. We are scared about some vascular post-operative complications, neurovascular complications. Just for precautions, we keep them for four days. <coughs> plaster is kept for three to four weeks. Remove the plaster and allow the movement. For after seven days, the wires are removed. So this is again. 18 days old injury with the callus, treated close, this is 4 weeks, again second another case 15 days old injury, treated in same way with almost good uh, accurate Bowman angle and there is no deformity. So <coughs> to conclude the cast immobilization and traction is not a safe method for late presenting supracondylar fracture. And operative treatment is the best option for the late presenting supracondylar fracture. Satisfactory results can be obtained using surgical treatment without mass ossification, reduces chances of cosmetically objectionable varus deformity. Open reduction through medial medial incision provide a better uh, better reduction, and then you can avoid the chances of a stiffness. If you use a posterior incision to reduce this, when you are doing it open reduction, the chances of stiffness and adhesions are more. So, if you need to open it, address the, both the pillars from one from medial side and one from lateral side, then the chances of stiffness and adhesions are less. This so this new technique is easy and reproducible and prevents the ugly deformity from malunion, no scarring, no stiffness, but larger studies and multicentric trials needs to be needs to establish this scale. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable tips on this very common problem, common presentation in our circumstances. Any questions? How much did you operate? I've shown you it, it is it was as late as but uh, twenty-five days. I'm trying for more cases which I have done one case recently which was five weeks old but in that case it was not exactly by this this is another I just made an incision from the posterior side and I, with our blunt osteotome I break the medial pillar and the lateral pillar and then again use the same technique and it was workable but I don't have experience of more than two cases like that but by up till 25 days you can do it but you need to see that it has to be a little bit sticky and you actually need to hold to uh, you need to hold the distal fragment otherwise you may damage the anterior capsule so you need to hold the uh, uh, distal fragment properly and then at times if you feel that it is not easy you can put a k wire across the uh, distal fragment and then hold and then try and manipulate but not excessive movement if you find that it is not workable then you need to go for an open reduction See, as per literature, it doesn't make any difference whether you use two lateral pins or one medial, one lateral or two lateral, one medial. It depends on certain some situations. If you have a condylar, uh, lateral condyle fracture separate, it's intracondylar, you may require two, two pins. But as per stability, yes, there is no much difference between two. But if, of course, if you are scared of ulnar nerve, you can e equally use lateral. But you need to have a difference of at least eight mm between two wires, and this should be parallel. Certainly, third three k wires are good. But if, it if at all it is needed, you, you are going to put three k wires only when you feel it. Otherwise, two k wires are sufficient.
cases, uh, two, three weeks, twenty days, twenty-one days, it, it works wonderfully. And uh, the reduction line is short. It comes at the same time. It comes at the same time. You must start and rotate the you must start the reduction and rotation. Everything falls into place. Try it one or two cases and you will come. Thank you so much. Sorry, okay. Thank you. Like Dr. Dhawan, excuse me as well for my bad throat. Uh, we are the organizers. And by the way, I hope you have enjoyed the IOCON 2013. Fracture Capitalum. It constitutes 0.5 to 1% of all elbow injuries and 6% of distal humeral fractures. Mode of injury is either fall on outstretched hand or on the point of elbow. If it is not seen below the age of 12 years, similar injury in a child would cause a supracondylar fracture or a lateral condylar fracture. It is more common in women due to greater carrying angle and osteoporosis. The surgical anatomy, it is the first epiphyseal center of the elbow to ossify. It is directed distally and anteriorly as Dr. Ram has shown at 30 degrees to the sagittal axis of the humerus. The center of rotation is 12 to 15 millimeter anterior to the axis of humeral shaft. The lateral collateral ligament is attached to the lateral margin of the capitulum. The blood supply, it is supplied from the posterior aspect by the lateral arcade of the anastomosis around the elbow. There are various classifications given for these fractures. One classification is type 1, Horn Steenthal type, commonest type with no involvement of the trochlea. Type 2 is the cocker lawrence type. It involves shell of cartilage with minimal subchondral bone. And type 3 is Grantham. Includes lateral part of trochlea, comminuted or unstable fractures. Brian and Modi classification, ring Jupiter classification, and the latest classification, the double classification came out in 2006. Type 1 is the primary capital fracture with or without the lateral trochlear ridge. Type 2 is the capital and trochlear fracture as one piece and type 3 is the capital and trochlear fracture as separate pieces. A without posterior condylar combination and B with posterior condylar combination. This is the commonly used classification nowadays. Type 1 fractures are caused by fall on outstretched hand. Fragment is displaced anteriorly and superiorly. Type 2 fracture is caused by fall on flexed elbow. Trochlear fracture is caused by fall on the olecranon. The clinical features, pain with minimal swelling and tenderness on the lateral aspect of the elbow. They are often missed fractures. Type 1 shows more limitation of flexion, while type 2 has more limitation of extension. Supination and pronation movements are painful and restricted. Investigations, plain x-ray, AP, lateral and external rotation views. The double arc, of, uh, arc sign of Mackey is important. It is an overlap of the subchondral bone of the displaced capitulum and lateral trochlear ridge. Radiograph the ipsilateral shoulder and wrist joints to exclude any concomitant injuries. The radial head capitular view given by Greenspan is sometimes required, specially useful to catch undisplaced fractures of capitulum, head of radius and coronoid. It is a modified lateral view. The tube is angled 45 degrees towards the radial head, projecting it ventrad. Unlike the lateral view, it clearly delineates the humero ulnar and humero radial articulations. Like we see here in the radial head capital view, the fracture is very evident in the C picture. CT scan may be required in certain cases, especially in pediatric patients to define the nature and pattern of the fracture and plan fixation accordingly. It may be associated with other injuries like the fracture of the head of radius, posterior dislocation of the elbow, disruption of the ulnar collateral ligament, ulnar nerve injury, disruption of the interosseous membrane and inferior radial nerve joint. Treatment options available are closed reduction and plaster immobilization. The most accepted treatment modality is open reduction and internal fixation. Excision of capital fragments should be avoided as far as possible and capitular prosthesis. Closed reduction in plaster, maintenance of reduction is very difficult thereby leading to poor results. 
and even close reduction may lead to avascular necrosis, probably due to the repeated manipulations to try and achieve an acceptable reduction. This is the most acceptable treatment of choice, especially with trochlear involvement. The surgical technique is simple. You use the Cocker's posterolateral J approach. This is the exposure. You reduce the fragment and fix it temporarily with a K wire. A 3.5 or 4 mm partially threaded cancellous screw with washer is passed from the posterior to the anterior and fracture fixed under compression. Herbert screws, Accutrack screws, headless screws, biodegradable wires, maxillofacial plates have been used by different people. Herbert screw is the preferred modality of fixation. It can be supplemented with K wires if needed. Resection of the fragment is indicated for small unfixable osteofragments only, specially contraindicated in trochlear fractures because it will lead to lateral instability. Arthroscopic excision is obviously less traumatic. Prostheses have been developed for the capital fractures as well. Jacobson in 1957 developed an alloy prosthesis with not very encouraging results. But Connie and Mori in 2006 published their results on radial capital prosthesis, the uni elbow. It is not yet available in India. The prognosis, if left untreated, causes impingement and restriction of motion and degenerative arthritis. Excision of large fragment causes instability and later loss of movements. Best results are achieved by open reduction and rigid internal fixation and early mobilization as in other intraarticular fractures. The complications can be stiffness, open reduction internal fixation has least incidence of stiffness, instability seen after resection, especially of the trochlear fractures. Avascular necrosis is very uncommon, less than 10% even after open reduction and internal fixation. Malunion and nonunion leads to stiffness and pain. Heterotropic ossification occurs in 4% of the cases of open reduction. These are some of our cases. I'll skip this. This is fixed with a single screw from posterior to anterior. The clinical results. The second case. Nowadays we use Herbert screws more. Another case. This is a type 4 fracture, a bad fracture. Fixed with a Herbert screw and additional K wires to supplement. Another case, a large fragment. Herbert screw and K wires. Only small, I may conclude, only small osteochondral and unfixable fragments should be excised. Larger fixable fragments should be fixed by 3.5 or 4 mm screws or Herbert screws. The seemingly potential complication of AVN should be ignored and all fixable fragments should be fixed. Thank you very much. Any questions, please? Uh, we are running late. I think we start the next. We move on to the Hall A for the valedictory function. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Sorry, sorry for all this, but I think so. We have to make a start. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, all palliative design of total knee replacement. Uh, early medium term results in patients who are above the age of 70 years of age. Uh, no disclosures, no conflict of interest for this particular study. Uh, various implant designs have been uh, used uh, in total knee replacement. The use of all polytibia is in practice since early 1970s. The first total condylar design that was ever put in 1974 was the total condylar all poly design. Early 80s saw introduction of modularity, that's uh, different. Uh, uh, metal base plate and uh, polyethylene insert. Now, because these are two different implants uh, doing the same thing, we reviewed the literature. Uh, clinical orthopedic in 2000 uh, showed a randomized compar comparison between all poly and the metal bacteria, and they showed no difference at three to five years. However, it was a short term study. The same author again in 2010. Uh, uh, reported at 10 years there is no difference between all polytibia and the metal back component. This was mid to long term results. It had uh, radio stereometric uh, analysis and prospective randomized control trials. 
Further, uh, JBJS in 2009, there was a direct comparison of all poly versus metal component. And at 10 years survivorship with aseptic loosening as the endpoint, the survivorship was 97% for all poly and 96.8% for the metal back. There was no significant difference between both of them, but both of them did very well with 96% or 97% survivorship. Uh, JBJS American 2011 cemented all poly versus metal back tibia. A meta-analysis showed no difference in the two groups in terms of functional status at two, eight, and 10 years. Long-term results again, 91% so survivorship at 23 years by Tom Skulko from Hospital of Special Surgery. 85% so survivorship at 20, 21 years in the hands of Dr. Ranawath, who was the original designer surgeon for this implant. So with this uh, literature backdrop in our mind, we wanted to report early medium-term results of all polytibial component uh, in elderly patients in our series. Inclusion criteria were physiological age above 70 years, low functional demand, good bone quality, exclusion criteria being inflammatory arthropathy, osteoporosis, poor bone quality, and high functional demand. 47 cases done between 2005 and 7. All cases were performed by myself using standard mechanical jigs or navigation. PS all polytypal components cemented with CMW1 gentamicin mixed cement. Pre-op bone mineral density DEXA scan was not performed. All the cases were that of osteoarthritis. Routine post-operative protocol of weight bearing mobilization started from the first day post-op. Of the 47, three were lost to follow up. Seven diseased because of some medical conditions. 37 cases at the time of last follow-up were available, 28 female and 9 were male patients. Mean age index surgery 74, pre-op KSS of 47 improved to 87 at the latest follow-up, 34 cases were performing well functionally and clinically. Of 37 cases, there were 3 revisions, 2 for septic and 1 for periprosthetic fracture. There are no revisions for aseptic loosening or osteolysis in this cohort of 37 patients. Uh, five knees have a non-progressive radiolucent line beneath the tibial component. Some cases, a 78-year-old gentleman, bilateral total knees uh, with uh, right. bilateral total knees done, five years post-op. Another lady, six years post-op. This were done simultaneous. 72-year-old uh, gentleman, five years post-op, 69-year-old lady, she had a failed high tibial osteotomy on one side and a failed hip because of an old tuberculous hip on the other side. Uh, so she had all poly on one side. Another 88-year-old gentleman, seven years post-op x-rays. 91-year-old gentleman, six years post-op. 74-year-old lady, five years post-op x-rays. Now these patients also, depending on their functional demand, they can perform high flexion activities. So this again proves the point that high flexion or the flexion post-operative that one gets depends on the pre-op flexion. Obviously what we do surgically also matters what soft tissue release and how bone cuts we've made. But even with a fixed bearing implant like all poly, if the patient is able to do this, they sometimes do in our social and religious setup. Failures, we had two dip sepsis. Both these patients had uh, uh, swollen knee, discharging sinus, and uh, they were operated. I would come back to that again, why most probably these two patients have failed. These are their x-rays, post-op loosening, and uh, they were revised. <coughs> Metal back tibia has an undersurface. An undersurface under wears from beneath the polyethylene of the tibia and the metal plate of the tibia. Highly polished trays are likely to eliminate this problem, but tibial load transfer is supposed to be uniform once we use a metal back tibia. This is the normal presumption. However, when we compared all poly versus modular implant in all these various aspects, we saw that undersurface wear, which is the main problem in the modular implant, is absent in all poly tibial component. Tibial load transfer is uniform in both metal back or all poly. Polyethylene thickness for identical resection is more in all polytypal component because it does not have to accommodate for the metal plate. Interop flexibility is the only point where all poly does not score high. 
Liner dissociation is absent in all polytable component and obviously cost is cheaper in all polytable component. However, there are some disadvantages of all polytabia. Lack of modularity, it limits the interop options that you cannot attach the stems, augments, uh, etc. There is no option of liner removal and debridement and washout in case of acute post-op infection. Perhaps this was the cause where we had two of our cases who had infection. They were open for a washout, but obviously the poly was not removed being a non-modular component. So this is the only disadvantage that I can think of uh, all polytable component. And late liner exchange cannot be done in case of minor instability of the uh, poly. Optimum poly thickness is 8 millimeter to avoid excessive peak stresses within the liner. When we have all poly, the amount of polyethylene that goes inside is more for the identical resection. So if we are able to put 10 millimeter of all poly tibia, that's all that you get the polyethylene into. But when you put a 10 modular knee, you have 8 millimeters of polyethylene insert or maybe a little less. So for the identical resection, we have more poly in all polytibial design. Reduced poly thickness risks the failure of wear through the metal on metal. This particular publication from Dr. Anavat, all polytibial component may be appropriate for younger and active patients. Excellent long-term clinical and radiographic results in younger patients of less than 65 years of age. Operative steps, perfect tibial cut, lateralization of femoral and tibial components, perfect gap balancing because there is no chance to change the polyliner once the cementing is happened and thin layer of cement normally put at the back of the tibial cut surface. <coughs> Elderly low demand patients generate lesser stresses on the articulation, reduces the incidence of premature wear and osteolysis. Perfect surgical technique is mandatory. So in conclusion, our series shows no revisions at early medium term, that is five to seven years for aseptic loosening. An excellent clinical result in this cohort of patients supports the continued use of this implant. For a cost conscious health system such as ours, the savings in the implant cost is significant. I thank you for your attention. Yes, please, yeah. Correct. Uh, now, if you see that particular uh, uh, publication from Dr. Anavat, he has mentioned the cutoff being 65 years of age. Patients less than 65 years of age, if we do all poly, the results are not very satisfactory. That's what Dr. Anavat mentioned. So, cutoff is 65 in his hands. 70 is because we want patients who are physiologically above the age of 70, they have lower stresses. They are more or less retired from their active functional life. So the stresses that it will generate on the implant and articulation will be much less. So we wanted to examine all poly as an implant. How does it do? We know that if given higher stresses in younger patients, it may fail. So that's the reason we put it in elderly patients because they generate less stress. One more question, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Do you think that uh, banging upon the poly during cementation is accept acceptable or justifiable? Banging? Yeah. Uh, because I mean, in a metal-backed tibia, it's a different scenario. Sure. You'll be banging on the metal correct. On, uh, and correct. putting on the right. again, liner again. Yeah. I mean, that can be a problem. But uh, just banging, you know, those three or four taps, I don't think so is going to damage the polyethylene. No, that's not going to happen. What can happen, though, is when you are banging it in, Sometimes the cement can have fretting. With each banging, the processes will go down little bit, cement. little bit, little bit. So the cement will not, it will have sort of small waves, you know, as you give more and more bangs. Instead, if you are able to put the cement on the pro proximal tibia and just with your hand in one movement, just try and insert the processes till the time it touches the bone and then just give one final tap. That's, That's what I do. But does it produce some sort of a surface lamination type or a small micro On the polyethylene? Poly, yeah. No, 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 no. It does not. On the upper surface? No, no, no. It does not. It does not. Because you know, you have those uh, silastic punches. So just put on that and give a gentle tap. It does not produce any lamination. Because the way in which the polys are manufactured now is a lot different than what it used to happen 30 years ago. I mean, that's why we even sometimes put this in uh, rheumatoid patients. Because 
you know, no matter the problem is osteopenia and osteoporosis, we are worried that the stress dissipation will happen properly or not. Using the modern all poly, the lower part of the polyethylene is so, so sturdily built and when the pressure starts from above, the lower part of the polyethylene really okay. almost offers like a metal. Though it's a plastic, but it is so sturdily built that you know it almost offers the stress resistance like a plus, uh, like a metal. So even putting in uh, rheumatoid is not a problem. Though I personally have not done in this series, but people have done it. Thank you. Okay. Any more? Right. Thank you very much. So next gentleman. Sorry, the late comers. You know we have no chairman, so we are the speakers who are just. Uh, you know, finishing all the talks. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary, I think so, is next. Here you carry on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. A very good afternoon to all of you. I am Dr. Siddha Chaudhary and my topic of presentation today is direct comparison of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of apixaban and rioroxaban. So this topic is a little bit different from the surgical intervention and it's about anticoagulants. Just to give you the background, apixaban and rioroxaban are oral direct factor 10A inhibitors which have shown promising results as anticoagulant drugs for several indications. And in India, both apixaban and rivaroxaban are approved for venous thromboembolism prevention in patients undergoing THR and TKR surgeries. The approved regimen is apixaban 2.5 mg twice daily, whereas rivaroxaban 10 mg OD is approved. Although a general relationship between exposure and efficacy and safety of direct factor 10 A inhibitors have been observed, but the key pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic parameters driving this relationship has not been identified clearly. So this study was aimed at developing a better understanding of the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics profiles of each agent. The objective was to assess the multiple dose steady state PK profiles of apixaban and rivaroxaban following oral administration in healthy subjects. Second objective was to compare the plasma concentration peak to trough that is maximum to minimum concentration of these drugs. Third one is to assess the multiple dose steady state pharmacodynamic profiles that is anti factor 10A activity of apixaban and rioroxaban. And the last objective is to assess the safety profile of these drugs. So this is the design of this trial. It was a phase one randomized open label two period two treatment crossover study on eligible healthy subjects. So these subjects after screening were randomized to one of the arm and they received four day treatment with either apixaban 2.5 mg BD or rivaroxaban OD. Followed by the period one, there was a washout period of five days. And then during the period two, there was a switch over of treatments. So the subjects who received apixaban during period one, they received rivaroxaban during period two and the subjects who received rivaroxaban during period 1, they received apixaban during period 2. And the blood samples were collected to assess the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile of these drugs, pre-dose on day 1 and day 2, and thereafter 72 hours after the dosing after day 4. Coming to the results here, this graph shows the mean plasma concentration over time after treatment. So here on the left side, you can see on the x-axis time in hours. On the y-axis, you can see the plasma concentration of these drugs. The red line denotes apixaban, whereas the blue line denotes rioroxaban. So here we can see that So here we can see the maximum plasma concentration after giving the dose is high with rioroxaban, whereas the trough concentration that is the minimum plasma concentration after 24 hours was low with rioroxaban as compared to apixaban twice daily regimen. And when we, 
and when we take the geometric mean to trough ratio that is the maximum to minimum plasma concentration it was 3.6 times higher for rioxaban as compared to apixaban that shows that this plasma concentration variability is less with apixaban bid regimen as compared to rioxaban od regimen and also the variability is high with rioxaban as compared to apixaban coming to the pharmacodynamic results here again on y x axis time in hours whereas in y axis anti factor 10a activity here you can see again with the anti factor 10a activity is very high with rioxaban after giving the dose whereas when you look at the trough trough value of this anti factor 10a activity with rioxaban it was very low so again this consistent effect was seen with apixaban bd regimen as compared to rioxaban od regimen and the variability with rioxaban was high as compared to apixaban bid regimen safety endpoints all were assessed by closely monitoring adverse events total 22 adverse events were reported and all these adverse events were mild in intensity like contusions epistaxis dizziness and so on and there were no deaths or serious adverse events were reported in this study so to conclude dosing with apixaban 2.5 mg twice daily resulted in significantly lower peak to trough fluctuation in plasma concentration and less fluctuation in anti factor 10a activity throughout the dosing interval compared with rioxaban 10 mg od regimen apixaban 2.5 mg bid resulted in less inter individual variability across all pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic exposure parameters as compared to rioxaban pk findings were similar with that of the previously reported studies and all the safety findings were equal in both the arms and there were no serious adverse event reported that's it thank you So currently in orthopedic surgery, rioxaban and apixaban, both are studied only in patients undergoing THR and TKR, not in other hip arthro uh, or uh, say hip fracture surgeries or any other surgeries. So currently we have data only in THR and TKR surgeries. Why would it be like that? Just want to understand the methodology of the study. Because uh, if you look at the endo study, so they have studied uh, what are the incidence of DVT or pulmonary embolism depending on the surgeries. so it was found that the incidence of dvt and pe it is around 40 to 60% in patients undergoing thr and tkr surgeries okay so that's why uh, to test this anticoagulation effect these populations were selected first but in the usa and europe uh, apixaban it has been approved for uh, stroke prevention also and atrial fibrillation for various and other indications but currently in india it is approved only for vtp in thr and tkr Uh, sir in this study particularly there were no side effects serious side effects because this objective of this study is very simple to study the differences in the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic parameters mm -hmm. but if you uh, you're talking about phase three trials like record trials are uh, definitely with anticoagulation bidding is a risk so uh, uh, rather than going into the details of phase three trials i will just stick to this pkbd profile so objective was to see how it differs so it is not differing very much with apixaban 2.5 gbd regimen as compared to rioxaban od regimen yeah. yeah people after this uh, uh, this and forwards uh, 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 this means is if someone develops dvd or pd then should this uh, switch to normal or whatever is also called in the yeah so the question is that if somebody uh, if the patient is receiving apixaban for venous thromboembolism prophylaxis but if that patient is developed dvt then what happens okay so these drugs are mainly for dvt prophylaxis after thr and tkr so if the patient develops dvt then that is the case of dvt itself so you should uh, treat the patient like the normal protocol so definitely the normal protocol is to use heparin first or lower molecule weight heparin first and then combine with warfarin because currently these drugs are not approved for dvt treatment although the data is published but in india currently it is not approved for dvt treatment so you should consider that patient as the dvt case and treat like the normal protocol is there any gap between starting the 
Yeah, so first of all, we don't have any clinical data from switching to apixaban to enoxaparin. But based on the pharmacokinetic profile, these drugs have got very short T-half. So if you look at the T-half of apixaban, based on this study, it is around 8.7 hours. So if you can wait for two T-halves, then only 25% of the drug would be there in the plasma. Okay, so you can, based on your judgment, you can switch after 24 hours. And looking at the patient benefit risk ratio, if the patient is at the high risk of bleeding, then you may want to wait for more time. Uh, I would like to add only just one point to this issue because of the speaker. Uh, one question has come from yes, that sir. side. Yes, sir. I had a very bitter experience seven years back in 2006, if I'm correct. I did a cemented total hip. Yes, and the patient was uh, around 64 year old male patient and uh, he is a diabetic case. Okay. And I kept that patient two days prior on enoxoparin. Okay. And the patient was absolutely fine up to five days and I was about to discharge him. And that guy developed all sorts of uh, irrelevant talk, uh, nasty behavior, throwing out himself like that. So ultimately when we investigated the case, when we did a CT angio, it came up to a big pulmonary thrombus, big at the, at the level of bifurcation. Yeah. So what I mean to tell the audience is, there is no guarantee that simple usage of low molecular weight, any sort of apparent, might be bimiparin, whatever, enoxaparin, whatever may be the thing. There is no guarantee that the patient will not develop as a DVT or PE. It only reduces the risk of complication. It will not prevent. You have to take it granted the word. It only reduces the risk, but it will no no LMWH as of now available as any evidence based data to say that they will definitely prevent either DVT or developing P. That's it. But uh, looking at the data of this NOAX, these drugs are potent as compared to enoxaparin. It was proved in various phase three clinical trials that efficacy wise, both apixaban and rivaroxaban, they are potent and the primary efficacy endpoint were significantly low with these drugs as compared to enoxaparin. But uh, to definitely look at the P, you need the very large sample size and as mentioned by you, but uh, all these DVT incidences were low with this NOAX. Uh, switch from enoxaparin to this drug or? Suppose the patient is on prophylactically on apixaparin or rivaroxaparin. Yeah. And the THR or TKR was performed and when to stop it? Okay, yes. How to stop it? Yeah. So, uh, according to recommendations, as per the AOS guidelines, latest guidelines, they are recommending to use this anticoagulant drugs at least for 10 to 14 days in both THR and TKR patients. In case of THR, they are recommending uh, up to six weeks. So if you look at this phase three clinical trials, which were conducted in these uh, oral anticoagulants, for TKR, they had used the drug for 10 to 14 days. And for THR, they had used the drug for 32 to 38 days. I think this duration is fine enough. Yeah, yeah. very good question. According to European regimen, uh, enoxaparin was started preoperatively. Okay. Enoxaparin I'm talking about. 12 hours before enoxaparin. This is the recommendations by European guidelines. But if you look at these drugs, apixaban and rivaroxaban, these drugs are started post-operatively. So apixaban was given in advanced trials, in these phase three trials. It was given 12 to 24 hours after surgery, whereas rivaroxaban was given 6 to 10 hours after surgery. Uh, the good part of these drugs is there is no requirement of any monitoring. Consistent effect is there. No anon monitoring is required. No PT monitoring, no PTT monitoring, nothing. Yes, yes. You can just stop the okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this highly high-level interaction. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my teachers, colleagues. Uh, today, I am uh, going to present upon acetabular cup placement in total hip arthroplasty, how to be accurate. Total hip arthroplasty has become a very frequently performed procedure nowadays, 
and the most challenging part of performing total hip arthroplasty is accurate placement of acetabular cup. Acetabular cup malpositioning is a prime cause of dislocation after total hip arthroplasty. Uh, however, Arcball et al. revealed an extremely low dislocation rate of 0.6% with use of the transverse acetabular ligament as a reference aid in acetabular cup positioning. Improper cup placement is also recognized as a risk factor for impingement and increased wear after total hip arthroplasty, both of which may result in implant failure and many other complications. So the objective of our study to hypothesize that the technique of acetabular cup placement by using transverse acetabular ligament and posterior leap of acetabulum as a guide ensures more accurate result than the commonly used conventional technique of acetabular cup placement by using the direction of the inclination rod and version rod provided with the acetabular cuff holding zig. Uh, 34 cases of total hip arthroplasty was performed in our department. Uh, out of them, uh, 29 had a fractured neck of femur and five of, uh, had avascular necrosis of femoral head. And they are allocated into uh, randomly into two groups. Uh, group A, that is the conventional technique, and group B, that is the technique by using transverse acetabular ligament and posterior leap. And the results are analyzed on the basis of preoperative and postoperative CT scan and X-rays. Although the expected uh, safe zone of antiversion and inclination is uh, 15 plus minus 10 degree and 40 plus minus 10 degree respectively, but we propose that the uh, reproducing patient's own inclination and antiversion gives the best result. This is the preoperative photograph uh, showing transverse acetabular ligament and posterior acetabular lip. Now, uh, from this table, uh, we can say that the proportion of both postoperative version and inclination within safe zone were higher in uh, our treatment group as compared to uh, conventional method. This is the master chart. And from group statistics, uh, we can also comment that uh, patients under uh, our study group had less difference in pre and post operative mean version and mean inclination than conventional treatment group. Uh, now I'm showing some uh, CT images of uh, normal version and post op version and normal inclination and post op inclination uh, in conventional technique. Another one. another now uh, the CT images uh, showing uh, normal version and post-op version in our study group normal inclination post-op inclination this is another case case B9 normal version post-op version normal inclination post-op inclination uh, now to uh, compare the accuracy uh, between these uh, two techniques, uh, we put up uh, two cases and in conventional method, uh, the preoperative uh, version was 3.9 degree and postoperatively it was 23.6 degree. So the difference was 19.7 degree and uh, in group B, that is uh, in our method, the preoperative uh, version was 7.2 degree and post-operative version was 9.6 degree. So the uh, difference was uh, 2.4 degree. Similarly, in case of inclination, in a conventional method, the preoperative inclination was 32.1 degree and post-operatively it was 60.9 degree. So the difference was 28.8 degree. And in our uh, study method that uh, the normal inclination was 42.7 degree and post-op inclination was 44.5 degree. So the difference was uh, 1.8 degree. Uh, so from these slides, it is quite evident that uh, by using transverse acetabular ligament and posterior leap of acetabulum, we can reproduce uh, the values near normal to patient's own inclination and aversion. Now in our study, we found that 75% of patients of group A uh, had post-operative version within the safe zone, whereas that was true for 95% of patients in group B. Similarly, the post-operative uh, inclination was within safe zone in 69% of patients of group A and 89% of patients in group B. 
From the statistical analysis, we are coming across the fact that the group B is statistically more significant than group A. Uh, therefore, we find that uh, although both methods gives result more or less within the safe zone, but using transverse acetabular ligament, we can place acetabular cup more accurately. That is uh, near normal to patient's own inclination and version. Uh, but uh, there are certain literature uh, indicating difficulties in identifying uh, transverse acetabular ligament and posterior lip of acetabulum, particularly in cases of pri primary osteoarthritis of hip, uh, where these structures may be obscured by osteophytes. Uh, however, uh, Arkball et al. originally claimed that it was seen in 99.7% cases, and also in a uh, case study of uh, 114 cases, uh, Myosi et al. Uh, were able to identify it in 81.6% cases. And uh, the most common indication of total hip arthroplasty in our study population was fractured neck femur. No patients in the study population had primary osteoarthritis of hip. Hence, uh, we had no difficulties in identifying transverse acetabular ligament and posterior leap of acetabulum intraoperatively. Uh, moreover, due to unavailability of facilities of proper patient positioning, tilting of pelvis from true lateral position was quite common and hence adversely affecting the acetabular cup placement by conventional method. So uh, in conclusion, we can say that the method of acetabular cup placement by using transverse acetabular ligament and posterior leap of acetabulum uh, is more accurate than conventional method when there is no problem in identifying these structures. Thank you. Is there any question? It's not a question actually, but I would like to just pass on a comment upon your lecture. One point you have stated that uh, uh, it will always work correctly if you confirm the cup to the native anatomic acetabulum. But that's not true in each and every case because in a few number of cases, which I have personally experienced, the native acetabulum will be in a little bit of retroversion. When you confine your cup to the specific margins of the posterior lip as well as the tal, you are definitely going to put your cup in a retroverted position. So what I suggest is that to carefully evaluate the pre-op x-rays to look for the signs of retroversion in the x-rays or else go for CT scans. Uh, I look specifically for the crossover sign, both for the anterior and posterior margin of acetabulum. If there is a crossover sign, it indicates that the acetabulum, native acetabulum is in retroversion then you have to voluntarily keep your cup in the antiverted position. So in such a case, confirming the cup to the native margins of the acetabulum is not going to work. Uh, exactly. Uh, in our uh, department, uh, we generally the, uh, done the preoperative CT scan, and then uh, we decide and uh, the cases are allocated uh, randomly, that uh, if uh, there is any uh, degenerative disease or something, or uh, there is retroversion, we uh, go for a conventional method. Suppose uh, we place the, uh, using the not, by not using the conventional uh, method, by using the tab and uh, and uh, if uh, that is somewhat retroverted, you are positively placed. Uh, apart from the range you have mentioned, plus minus tab, then uh, how to, we have framed and we have placed the acetabulum, then how to manage the if uh, preoperatively uh, we we get that uh, the cup is uh, retroverted, then uh, we'll go for conventional method. Then uh, you have to uh, go for uh, the. Uh, if we retract both the structures, we are not going to put the place, 100% situations, we are not going to put the structure cup in the same degree. Uh, if you uh, don't judge the uh, version of the cup preoperatively, then uh, it is uh, quite uh, impossible to uh, judge uh, paraoperatively. If you, excuse me, may I answer that question, please? Yeah. You mean to say that if the you have placed, you cemented the cup in a retroverted portion, how is that you are going to correct it? Am I right? That's your question, no? There are specific stems, specific stems in specific companies wherein they give altered anti-version, retroversion grades. 
not all companies will provide that. Wherein, yeah, you can adjust that with the stem. According the to the parameter of the liquidated cup. Yeah, what can you do after that cementing the cup? There is no way, there is no way bailing out. So the only way to tackle that problem is to have a differential anti-version, retroversion. Next, you have in certain companies. They do provide that. So you have the option in such a case. So Not in all companies. Either method we can uh, uh, go with the astronaut, but interoperability we have to place. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. Our target was the uh, total uh, version is femoral uh, version plus astabular cup version is 40 degree. So if the, there is any problem that uh, more than 25 degree, then sir uh, said that uh, we can adjust by femoral uh, version. It's only a bailout option. It's not the perfect, I mean, uh, remedy or solution for that. It's only a bailout. Somehow you have to get out of the procedure. <laughs> Somehow you have to get out of the OT room. So it's only a bailout thing. It's not the perfect solution for that. The stem, I mean, the stem during different range of motions will not dislocate. But that particular patient might not have the complete range of motion. It's a bailout option. Uh, in uh, in a uh, study of thousand cases, Arbold uh, graded the um, uh, transverse vestibular. Uh, how uh, we can uh, identify the transverse vestibular ligament? There was uh, four grading system, and uh, in case of uh, grade four, like uh, in uh, any degenerative condition, uh, we cannot identify uh, transverse vestibular ligament interoperably. So uh, up to grade two, it is uh, we can make it easily. But in grade three, we have to re uh, rim the SWR cup. Uh, well, we have to rim the SWR cup more carefully. Uh, 